So uh, this is one of my favorite stories from scripture. This is the story of Ruth. It's not often in the Bible that you get a text that has women at the center. So you gotta just take it in when you can. This is actually about two, two women. The men kind of go off the scene fairly, <laughs> fairly early in this story. And to me, this story is about finding family. Finding family where you might least expect it, maybe even in your own family. So in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. This is like a story, tale, story a, a fairy tale, right? Where something big and overwhelming is happening, right? And so there was a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah who went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. Don't make me say that name again. And so they went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she was left with her two sons. Those took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other, Ruth. So when they lived there about 10 years, both Malan and Chilean also died so that the woman was left without her two sons and without her husband. And then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she'd heard in the country of Moab that the Lord considered his people and had given them food. Again, this was in a time of famine. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. Go back to your mother's house. And may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you might find security, each of you, in the house of your new husbands. And then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Naomi's in a dark place. And then they wept aloud again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. May God add understanding to our hearing of these still powerful words and this still powerful story. So let us pray to hear a good word from my words and from your reflections. Shall we pray? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of us, may they give you joy, O oh God. You who strengthen us day by day and you who lead us day by day into new and abundant life. Amen. Well, I have decided not to go home for Thanksgiving. 
and it's, this is not dark. I'm not, it's not that I don't want to see my family. <laughs> my reasons are much more boring. <laughs> For one thing, I just saw them last weekend. And thank you to all, you may have known that I went home last weekend to, to carry my inheritance um, back with me here to Connecticut and uh, things are set up in my house now since my childhood home is being sold, yada, yada. Anyway, so I just saw my family last weekend and also Thanksgiving, you may know, is late this year. And so it's very, very close to the first Sunday of Advent and you can't keep a pastor from missing the first Sunday of Advent? Come on. <laughs> so that's reason two. And then reason three is the actual travel, which is air travel around Thanksgiving. So do I need to say more about why I'm not going home for Thanksgiving? I didn't think so. But instead, I want to say to you that I am going home for Thanksgiving. I am going home for Thanksgiving. I'm just not going to Iowa. I'm going to crash another family's Thanksgiving. The Thanksgiving of my friend and my former boss, Rose. And I thought you might want to see a picture of her. Let's see if Rose, there's Rose. Obviously, she's the person and the dog is my dog, Esther. <laughs> so that's who I'm going to spend Thanksgiving with, her family. Her family is loud and talkative and a little bit bossy, and so I, I think I should fit right into that. <laughs> and Rosa and I have now known each other for about 15 years. I was her, her um, kind of work-study student in seminary, and we couldn't be more different. I, I don't know Rosa's exact age, nor would I ever dare ask, but I think we have about 40 years between us. She spent her formative years in Puerto Rico, and I am painfully Midwestern. Rose can cook the best rice and beans that you've ever had. I grew up putting rice and beans in a casserole and adding a can of Campbell's soup. <laughs> so Rose is not my family in the strict biological sense, but she is my family. She's family that I have chosen, and I hope she's chosen me. And that's why I am going home for Thanksgiving. I'm just not going to Iowa. Rose is going to distract you, so I think we're going to put the... <laughs> Bye, Rose. Bye, Esther. <laughs> I think that Ruth is facing a similar decision when she finds herself in a foreign country, suddenly widowed, and quickly running out of options. It's kind of cinematic the way it happens in Ruth that all these people die one after the other. Ruth's father-in-law dies, right? Then her own husband, and then her brother-in-law and the women who are left behind include Ruth and Naomi and Orpah. And can you imagine, can you imagine, maybe you can, what it would have been like to lose all those men in those days? What choice do you have left? What choice do you have left? I think you've got to find another guy. That's pretty much the choice. And they're going to, but just not yet. So Naomi does this beautiful matriarch thing, right? And she tells her daughters-in-law, look, I have no more sons for you. I literally cannot bear them fast enough, even if I started tonight. <laughs> um, that was supposed to be funny in the text. I don't know if you got that. You can't wait a few decades for those guys to grow up. So basically your option is, your one option is to go back to your people, to the land of Moab, and to get yourself on Match.com. Right? And so Orpah sees the wisdom of this, right? She sees the wisdom of this, right? And she goes on her way. But Ruth, Ruth is not ready to leave. She and Naomi may not be biologically related. They might come from different places, different backgrounds, cultures, religions. They might have nothing in common now, really, except the past. But that's not how Ruth sees it. I think it's only in facing a future without Naomi, as it sometimes happens with us, right? It's only in facing a future without someone that we realize what they mean to us. And so it's true, maybe not in the strict sense that Naomi and Ruth are family, but in the spiritual sense they are. And so wherever Naomi goes, 
Ruth will go. Wherever Naomi finds a home, Ruth has one too. And just like that, Ruth had a family that she chose. It has really been a long time since the American family, at least as it was portrayed in like 1950s sitcoms, actually meaningfully existed. Do you know what I mean by 1950s sitcoms, right? A mom and a dad and 2.5 children and probably a golden retriever and a white picket fence, right? In fact, I think it was, uh, I found a statistic from 2013 that said that only 19% of U.S. households include a married couple with children. 19%, and that was a statistic from six years ago. Do you think it's gone up or gone down? Right? So if less than a third of American families fit inside a white picket fence, why on earth are we holding on as a culture to this ideal when the vast majority of us live in some other kind of configuration. Can I hear an amen? amen? I think the vast majority of us, aren't we, are single or single parents with kids, or a married couple without kids, or whose kids have flown the coop, or we're widowed, or raising our grandchildren, or divorced, or our white picket fence includes two men and two women with or without 2.5 kids, right? And isn't it true that our family changes throughout our lifespan, right? I'm watching my dad try to figure out the dating scene of 2019 as a widower. It's a little bit different than the 1970s, right? It's a little different. Now, I grew up, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a more conservative Christian environment where the white picket fence ideal was held up for everybody, for everybody. But now I think that's way, way too narrow, way too narrow. And you know what? It's not even that biblical, right? What's biblical is something like this story, right, of Ruth and Naomi. And yeah, it's true. Their long-term practical solution involves getting a guy. It's going to happen. But I think the real emotional turning point of Ruth and Naomi's story is when Ruth says to Naomi, I'm yours. I hope you're mine. Will you be my family? In so many ways, it's the families that we choose. It's the families that we choose, the family we choose, that define our lives. Think about it. Think about the people that you consider family. Maybe you do share DNA. Maybe you share the same hairline, <laughs> the same laugh or the same frown. Or maybe you don't. Maybe your family are your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your church. Maybe your family are the people that you'll sit next to at the Thanksgiving table, and maybe your family are the people you call after you get home from Thanksgiving to talk about what happened at the Thanksgiving table, right? The earliest Christians did call each other sister and brother, sister and brother. And I take that to mean that our faith isn't supposed to keep us mindlessly eating the same old casserole year after year after year. Our faith is supposed to expand our horizons to see family and people we're not related to, to feel kinship with the whole of creation, and to see that we all belong to each other because we belong to God. The crises of our age, the crises of our age are coming to, to be about how limited or how broad our own identities are and whose family and who gets to be family, who gets to be part of us and who gets to stay as them. This is a spiritual mandate, the family we choose. 
So in one sense, I am not going home for Thanksgiving. But in another sense, in a deeper sense, I am going home for Thanksgiving. How sad it would be if I thought that home is just a place. But Ruth knows better. Home isn't a place. Home is family. Amen.